An incredibly gifted writer, he became one of the first vocal champions of American rights. Yet, despite the bloodshed at Lexington and Concord, he was one of the last to recognize the need to break away from Great Britain and declare independence. When the Declaration of Independence was ready to be signed, he resigned from Congress rather than ascribing his name to a nation he did not believe was prepared for self-governance. Despite his critics loudly denouncing him as a loyalist, he would later earn the nickname the Penman of the Revolution for his authorship of so many documents for the First and Second Continental Congresses. He was only one of two members of the Continental Congress to actively take up arms during the Revolution. His name was John Dickinson, and it's his story we'll look at today. Welcome to America's Forgotten Founders, where we will look at people whose contributions to the American Revolution, whether on the battlefield, in the halls of power, or on the home front, have been all but forgotten by the annals of history. The man who would eventually be called the penman of the Revolution was born on his family's tobacco plantation near the village of Trapp in Talbot County, Maryland, on November 8, 1732. His parents were Samuel and Mary Dickinson. John was born into a life of wealth and comfort. His father, Samuel, was a profitable landowner and lawyer. By the time of his death, the family would own over 9,000 acres. In 1740, Samuel, his second wife Mary, and their two sons moved to their plantation in Kent County, Delaware, named Poplar Hall. Here, John was taught how to run a plantation and manage and discipline slaves. Like the other sons of wealthy landowners, John received a good education, being taught not only by his parents, but several tutors as well. The most influential tutors were Presbyterian minister Francis Allison and the academic William Killen. Killen, who would remain a lifelong friend, especially emphasized rhetoric and writing to the young Dickinson. Despite his strong ties to Minister Allison, John was a proud third-generation Quaker. He lived and breathed his deeply held Quaker values and beliefs, which would shape his future political career. At 18, John began clerking for John Moland, a prominent attorney in Pennsylvania. Not content with his education, by 1753, John leveraged his family's connections to attend Middle Temple, a prestigious law school in London. While at Middle Temple, John developed personal and political relationships that would last a lifetime. After three years in the mother country, John returned home to the colonies at the end of 1756. By 1757, he was accepted to the Pennsylvania State Bar and began practicing in Philadelphia. When his father passed away in 1760, John inherited part of Poplar Hall. He would continue to manage the plantation's affairs in absentia for over a decade and a half. While in Philadelphia, John married Mary Norris, a wealthy, well-educated Quaker, on July 19, 1770. The happy couple would go on to have five children, though only two, Sarah and Maria, would survive to adulthood. Living in one of the largest cities in the colonies, the young, wealthy, and well-educated Dickinson quickly took center stage as Great Britain and her American colonies increasingly came into conflict in the mid-1760s. Despite his opposition to some British policies, Dickinson was no radical. While serving as one of Pennsylvania's delegates to the Stamp Act Congress in 1765, he was quickly tapped to write their Declaration of Rights and Resolves. This declaration was the first time the American colonists expressed the sentiment that they were, quote, entitled to all the inherent rights and privileges of the king's natural-born subjects within the kingdom of Great Britain, and that one of those rights should be, quote, that no taxes should be imposed on them, but with their own consent, given personally or by their representatives. This document was the first official document drawn up and agreed upon by a combination of American colonies. Just two years later, in 1767, he published his Letters from a Farmer in Pennsylvania in protest of the Townshend Acts. In the document, despite his misgivings on no taxation without representation, 
Dickinson argued that Britain had the right to control and regulate trade within the empire. There is no privilege the colonies claim, which they ought, in duty and prudence, more earnestly to maintain and defend than the authority of the British Parliament to regulate the trade of all her dominions. He pleaded with his fellow colonists to seek a peaceful solution within the British constitutional system. That constitutional system, to Dickinson, protected the colonies from European aggression and allowed them the peace and prosperity they so desired. Great Britain is our advanced post or fortification, which remaining safe, we, under its protection, enjoying peace, may diffuse the blessings of religion, science, and liberty through remote wildernesses. It is, therefore, incontestably our duty and our interests to support the strength of Great Britain. He further argued that if the colonies were to be torn from the body to which we are united by religion, liberty, laws, affections, relations, language, and commerce, that the colonies would bleed at every vein. This document was widely read in both the colonies and the mother country. In the colonies, the letters from a farmer in Pennsylvania were quickly embraced by many. In Great Britain, the view was much more critical. With the exception of a few Whig newspapers, the vast majority of publications denounced the document. It should be of little surprise that the infamous Dickinson, now publicly known as the author of the Letters from a Farmer in Pennsylvania, was chosen as a delegate to the First Continental Congress. Like most of the members present, Dickinson was a moderate who, while he wanted his grievances addressed, sought reconciliation with Great Britain. To this end, he was appointed the primary author of the 1774 Petition to the King. Though this document restated and clarified the colonists' grievances with the king and with Parliament, it still ended with a statement of loyalty and fidelity. Permit us then, most gracious sovereign, in the name of all your faithful people in America, with the utmost humility, to implore you, for the honor of Almighty God, whose pure religion our enemies are undermining, for your glory, which can be advanced only by rendering your subjects happy and keeping them united, for the interests of your family depending on an adherence to the principles that enthroned it, for the safety and welfare of your kingdoms and dominions threatened with almost unavoidable dangers and distresses, that your majesty, as the loving father of your whole people, connected by the same bands of law, loyalty, faith, and blood, though dwelling in various countries, will not suffer the transcendent relation formed by these ties to be farther violated in uncertain expectation of effects that, if attained, never can compensate for the calamities through which they must be gained. The king never formally replied. During this time, Dickinson also authored the Address to the Inhabitants of the Province of Quebec, where he sought to convince the predominantly French population to join the colonies to guarantee their rights. The address did not achieve the desired effect. At the Second Continental Congress the following year, Dickinson again headed a last-ditch effort to conclude a peaceful reconciliation between the king and the colonists by offering the Olive Branch Petition. The document, coming several months after the battles of Lexington and Concord, nonetheless expressed a profound desire for peace with Great Britain. Attached to your majesty's person, family, and government, with all devotion that principle and affection can inspire, connected with Great Britain by the strongest ties that can unite societies, and deploring every event that tends in any degree to weaken them, we solemnly assure your majesty that we not only most ardently desire the former harmony between her and these colonies may be restored, but that a concord may be established between them upon so firm a basis as to perpetuate its blessings, uninterrupted by any future dissensions, to succeeding generations in both countries. The king never even opened the petition. By the time it arrived, the king, in the aftermath of the Battle of Bunker Hill, had issued the proclamation of rebellion on August 23rd, declaring all 13 colonies to be in open rebellion. While working on the Olive Branch petition, Dickinson worked with John Adams on his model treaty, 
a template treaty between the new United States and foreign powers. He also extensively revised Thomas Jefferson's declaration on the causes and necessity of taking up arms. While serving with the Second Continental Congress, Dickinson believed that conflict between the colonies and Great Britain had become inevitable. Despite his best efforts, reconciliation was now impossible. While he grudgingly accepted that independence was coming, he thought the colonies were ill-prepared for it. Dickinson argued that the new country needed a constitution to bring some semblance of unity to the new nation and spell out the duties of Congress. Dickinson made clear his position in a speech before Congress. I know that the tide of the passions and prejudices of the people at large is strongly in favor of independence. I know, too, that I have acquired a character and some popularity with them, both of which I shall risk by opposing this favorite measure. But I had rather risk both than speak or vote contrary to the dictates of my judgments and conscience. Congress agreed, and Dickinson was allowed to chair a committee that started rewriting Benjamin Franklin's draft, Articles of Confederation. One of the first things Dickinson did was change the name of the new country in Franklin's draft from the United Colonies of North America to the United States of North America. Over the next few weeks, Dickinson infused Franklin's Confederation system with his own ideas and principles. Borrowing heavily from British law, he created a national legislature that held authority over the states. Drawing heavily from his religious background, the document also guaranteed civil rights at the national level and granted the federal government the sole power to make foreign policy. Before Dickinson could put the finishing touches on his version of the Articles, Congress decided to vote on whether or not to sign the Declaration of Independence. Despite his best efforts to postpone the vote, it proceeded as scheduled on August 2nd, 1776. Every delegate present except Dickinson voted yes. He, in good conscience, could not vote yes. But he also didn't want to spoil the unanimity of the vote by voting no. Forced to choose between betraying his principles or his fellow citizens, he instead resigned from Congress. While Dickinson became only one of two members of the Continental Congress to actively take up arms and participate in the war, the Continental Congress proceeded to gut his draft of the Articles of Confederation. The strong national legislature he proposed became instead an advisory body. The civil rights protections he enshrined at the national level disappeared entirely. And although Congress was granted permission to conduct foreign affairs, they had no means of enforcement. What exactly Dickinson did after resigning from Congress is unclear. While some sources say he fought in the Pennsylvania state militia as a private, others claim it was the Delaware state militia. Both options are undoubtedly plausible, despite living in Philadelphia, owning Poplar Hall also made him a citizen of Delaware. Some sources claim that Dickinson served as a brigadier general in the Pennsylvania militia, the Delaware militia, or even the Continental Army. Some sources claim he was offered the commission, but turned it down. At any rate, we do know he briefly served as a soldier in some capacity. By December 1776, Dickinson was living at Poplar Hall with Mary. He refused a commission as a brigadier general in the Delaware State Militia in October 1777. Despite remaining largely distant from political affairs in 1777, John Dickinson decided to begin freeing his slaves. Being the largest slaveholder in Delaware, he came under fierce criticism from some of his contemporaries. He likely decided to free his slaves due to a combination of his Quaker beliefs revolutionary fervor, and the fact that his plantation had shifted away from more labor-intensive crops, like tobacco, to less labor-intensive ones, like wheat. It is rare for people to be driven by a single motivation. His decision to free his slaves was likely a culmination of moral, political, religious, philosophical, and economic factors. At any rate, Dickinson remains the only founding father 
to have freed his slaves between 1776 and 1786. While residing at Poplar Hall, Dickinson was informed that his and Mary's house near Philadelphia, Fair Hill, was burned by the British during the Battle of Germantown on October 4th, 1777. In January 1779, Dickinson returned to the Continental Congress as a delegate, this time from Delaware. During his brief tenure, he signed the much neutered Articles of Confederation. He was elected President of Delaware on November 13, 1781, by the Delaware General Assembly. The only delegate to the Assembly that didn't vote for Dickinson was Dickinson himself. During his time as President, his proclamation against vice and immorality sought to rein in the disorders of the revolution in Delaware. The policy proved not only popular in Delaware, but in Pennsylvania as well. Always favoring Pennsylvania over Delaware and seeing a chance to return to the limelight, John ran for and was appointed president of Pennsylvania on November 7, 1782. He actually served in both positions concurrently until he resigned from his post as president of Delaware on January 12, 1783. His time as president of Pennsylvania was difficult. The position of president was weak by design, so Dickinson was forced to collaborate with an often hostile General Assembly. He nonetheless did what he could. He successfully negotiated land disputes with Virginia in the South and Connecticut in the North. He also nonviolently helped end the Pennsylvania Mutiny of 1783. His exact reasoning for taking a soft-handed approach is unknown. It has been suggested he sympathized with the soldiers' complaints. It's also possible he was unsure whether the militia he had nominal control over as president would actually act against their fellow soldiers. The mutiny was the main factor that drove Congress to replace Philadelphia as the new nation's capital and create instead a new federal district under their express control. After his term as president of Pennsylvania, Dickinson returned to Delaware. Despite angering many Delawareans by abandoning their state to serve as president in another state, Pennsylvania, he nonetheless remained a highly respected former statesman. He was appointed as a delegate to both the Annapolis Convention and the Constitutional Convention. He served as president of the Annapolis Convention. Ultimately, despite being a Democratic Republican, Dickinson favored the new Constitution, which adopted much of the framework of his earlier draft of the Articles of Confederation. Delaware became the first state to ratify the new Constitution of the United States on December 7, 1787. Despite Delaware very quickly ratifying the document, many other states were hesitant. Dickinson, under the pen name Fabius, wrote nine essays in a bid to try and sell the new document to his countrymen. When Delaware sought to revise their 1776 constitution in 1791, Dickinson chaired the convention. His health began to decline, and Dickinson would last serve as a state senator in 1793 before resigning at the year's end. In 1801, he published a two-volume work on politics. John Dickinson died in Wilmington, Delaware on February 14, 1808, aged 75. He was buried in the Friends Burial Ground. Like many of the people we have looked at in this series, John Dickinson was a man of immense contradiction. He built his fortune on the back of his slaves, yet intensely disliked that institution on both religious and political grounds, and he chose to free his slaves much earlier than any other founding father. He called for the non-violent resistance of the colonists against Great Britain and declared himself a loyal subject of the king, while later serving as a soldier against the empire in the war. He wrote the Olive Branch Petition, professing his desire for peaceful reconciliation with the crown while co-authoring the declaration on the causes and necessity of taking up arms. He was an intellectually gifted man who advocated reason and logic above all else, yet remained devoted to his Quaker principles to his dying breath. 
but despite his beliefs, because he was an advocate for the lawfulness of defensive war, he never was allowed to join the religious society of friends. Although he did not sign the Declaration of Independence, he authored more documents than anyone else on behalf of the Continental Congress. In the end, perhaps Thomas Jefferson, reflecting on Dickinson's legacy after his death, best encapsulates his contributions to the foundations of the United States. A more esteemable man or truer patriot could not have left us. Among the first of the advocates for the rights of his country when assailed by Great Britain, he continued to the last the orthodox advocate of the true principles of our new government, and his name will be consecrated in history as one of the great worthies of the revolution. I hope you found this video both informative and exciting. Make sure to like, subscribe, and comment, and join us next time as we look at our next forgotten figure, the general, statesman, and traitor, James Wilkinson.